Some parallelism, fully automated. You don't have to do a thing to get it to work. Other parallelism requires a skill set from the programmer. All parallelism requires support from the hardware. What we're going to talk about now is something called granularity. In other words, parallelism can ha happen at all sorts of levels. You know, we talk a little bit about this thing called fully automated parallelism, something that's going on inside of the processor. Think about pipelining. We spoke in a previous episode about how pipelining takes a sequence of instructions, breaks it into pieces, right? And so what you've got, and this is a very crude representation, but we've got our fetch, decode, and execute of an instruction. Fetch, decode, and execute. Fetch, decode, and execute. And pipelining allowed us to overlap those, those operations. So in, in, if you look at this, really what the, what the processor, what the CPU is doing is three things at one time. It's executing instruction one, decoding instruction two, and fetching instruction three. That's in parallel. This is something we would refer to as fine-grained parallelism specifically instructions. So it's instruction fine grade, fine grained parallelism. There are other types too, and we haven't talked about it in this series yet, but there's something called a super scalar machine. Now, a super scalar machine, a very interesting machine, what it does is it says, you know, why don't we create multiple execution units. And what you've got is some sort of a scheduler here. All right, so you get instructions and it can bring in from the cache multiple instructions. And it takes a look at the instructions. This is fully more automated in the hardware. It takes a look at your instructions and says, is there a dependency of one instruction on, an on another like if, if I'm, for example, doing something like A is equal to B plus C, and then D is equal to A times five, we've got a dependency. I have to do this instruction before I do this instruction. But what if this is D is equal to E times five? These are two fully independent instructions. And what the scheduler can do is it can say, okay, I am going to get or activate two of these pipes to work on these two instructions. And then you've got some mechanism to bring everything back together on this, this, this end so that we can all keep everything operating exactly the way the programmer intended for it to be executed. Now this is internal to the CPU, like pipelining. So once again, we're talking about instruction-based fine-grained parallelism. It's at the instruction level. All right. Now, turns out there's even another kind of this instruction fine-grained parallelism, and this is something called a very large instruction word. Now, this is really based on the programmer skill set. And so what the programmer does is the programmer looks at these two, or the compiler, because this is really happening at the assembly language level. The compiler may look at these two instructions, or the programmer may look at those two instructions and say, you know, what I'm going to do is I've got a very large instruction. Now, this very large instruction, machine code, is capable of actually carrying multiple operations. And so what you may do is have a couple of these that are dedicated to, okay, a load or a store from memory, an exchange with memory, a couple that may be uh, set up to do uh, operations, all right? And so what the, what the compiler or the programmer does is it puts one instruction in one slot, one instruction in another slot, and the processor grabs that whole instruction as if it's a single instruction, and it routes it to the different units, the different execution units. And in that case, really what you're doing is the compiler or the programmer replaces the scheduler. All right. What's nice about this is you only compile code once, right? You execute code over and over and over again. So compile once, 
very large instruction word makes it really easy. Now, the problem is, is that oftentimes, like with the superscalar machine, if there's a dependency, you may not be able to fill up all the slots at one time in order to fully utilize all of the pipes or all the execution units in our machine. Now, that brings us to fine grain data parallelism. Give me a second and I'm going to erase this board. Now we talked about this in the previous lesson where if I have vectors and what I've got is this idea of multiple elements in a vector being combined with multiple elements from another vector. Could be addition, could be some sort of a higher level uh, mathematical operation. What we've got now is fine grained parallelism Except this time, what we're talking about is data. So the data itself is being operated on at a very low level. You're talking about things like real-time graphics, talking about any sort of audio processing, any sort of vector arithmetic that you might be doing, all right? So there's fine-grained instruction and data. Now, coarse-grained parallelism, well, it really takes on that, remember we talked in the Flynn's taxonomy about multiple instruction, multiple data stream. A coarse grained parallelism really takes on that flavor. Now what you're looking at basically is processes that can be performed independently. Now, the thing that we're looking for whenever it comes to parallelism, whenever it comes to coarse grain, so this is coarse grained parallelism, what you're looking for is low communication overhead. Now, why we haven't we haven't really spoken about this idea of communication overhead, but if you've got a process where there's a lot of interaction between these parallel threads, then that time it takes to do that communication, passing messages back and forth, that's going to really chew into any sort of performance improvement you might have gained through parallelism. You want to avoid as you want to avoid as much communication as possible. Now, it depends a lot on this idea of how far the processors are away from each other, whether they're really tightly grouped together, tightly connected, uh, or whether they're more loosely connected. So we've got something called symmetric multiprocessor. We'll go into that in the next lesson. This is basically your multi-core processor. Now, you have the ability to share memory, so the effect of communication it's not as bad, but there's still a problem. We'll talk about that whenever we talk about how we implement SMP machines. But then you also have something called clusters. These groups of machines, multiple independent machines that are communicating typically across a network. Every one of those messages we have to pass between processes from one machine to another machine, that's a communication overhead. You wanna avoid that as much as possible. From here, what we're going to do is we're going to start moving on to some of the consequences of trying to implement independent processes on multiple machines.